So, I bet you're all wondering why I've gathered you here today. RNA seek. What is it? Where does it come from? And how do we use it to annotate just about any gene we want? Well, my hope is that by the end of this video, you'll know the answer to those questions and so much more. My name is Christina Ray Santos. I'm a TA for the Genomics Education Partnership, and you're watching a TA tutorial on RNA seek. Let's get started. <laughs> Okay, so first things first, let's bring up the UCSC Genome Browser. And let's start by going to thegep.org forward slash pathways or forward slash F element, depending on what project you're working on. For the sake of keeping today's video consistent, I'm going to be sticking with pathways today, but here's a little glimpse at what the homepage for the F element looks like. Now, either one you use, though, I would definitely recommend that you bookmark or favorite that page since it's going to have just about any link you could possibly need for your gene annotations, including the one we'll be using today, the UCSC Genome Browser. So let's go ahead and click on that. Oh, and keep in mind that there are tons of ways to get here. This is just my favorite way. Okay, now notice that the default for represented species is going to be D. melanogaster, but I'm more than willing to bet that you are not annotating something from this species, and that's because it's already the most heavily studied one here. So to make this tutorial most representative of something you'll actually be given, we'll go with, let's go with D. simulans for now, and then as for the assembly, just make sure it's the correct one. If you're not sure, go back to the Pathways homepage and click on the Pathways Project Genome Assemblies link to confirm. Or if you're doing the F element project, just choose the assembly that includes F element or dot in the title. But also your faculty member ought to have given you the assembly you'll be working in. Lastly, for the search term, you can input a gene symbol, protein name, coordinates, succession numbers, and so on. I'm gonna put in TRA, which is the gene symbol for the transformer gene. And you can also include the isoform for more precision and potentially even faster results. Okay, once you're here, you'll see the RNA-seq track usually located at the bottom of your window, depicted as a histogram, with the heights proportional to the number of reads per million mapped reads for each individual nucleotide as you go along the track. But before we go any further, in order for us to best understand RNA-seq, we ought to know how it's obtained. And at this time, I'd like to point out that the GEP YouTube channel has tons of videos, some of which relate to RNA-seq and go into more depth with this process, if you'd like to check those out. Otherwise, keep watching and I'll do my best to recap. First, we'll need to have the genomic DNA assembly that we'll be aligning the reads to. By sequencing the genomic DNA, we get a full picture of the genome regardless of where or how it's expressed. This can be done using a variety of methods, which fall under first, second, also known as next, or third generation sequencing, also known as shotgun, mass parallel, and single molecule sequencing, respectively. Sequencing technologies include Sanger, Illumina, Ion Torrent, Roche, Oxford Nanopore, PacBio, and much more, <laughs> all of which have their pros and cons. Generally, it's good practice to use a combination of as many sequencing methods as you have available to ensure the most accurate and well-supported consensus sequence possible. Now, what in the approximated 140 million base pair long genome is actually being expressed? And for what purpose? Well, to answer that question, we look to the messenger RNA, or mRNA, which acts as customized copies of the genes that make up the genomic library containing instructions used to make unique proteins. By aligning these copies together with the whole genomic library, we can see what parts were used to further determine what role they play in that organism. Now, there are multiple ways to go about this process, so I won't go into too much detail, but basically, a sample of the specimen cells in question is lysed so that the contents of the cell, including the mRNA, can be collected and purified by running the lysate mixture through or over some sort of medium that has a high affinity and specificity for the mRNA molecules, often by taking advantage of the fact that poly A tails are generally unique to mature processed mRNA. Great, so now we can just start sequencing, right? wrong, actually. Despite the name RNA-seq, we rarely directly sequence the mRNA because of the single-stranded nature that's meant to allow for degradation shortly after translation, which I guess you could say isn't exactly optimal if you want it to stay together for the sequencing process. So to solve this problem, 
we can add an enzyme by the name of reverse transcriptase that will build a complementary strand to the now isolated mRNA molecules, converting it into a more stable, double-stranded molecule that can withstand being sequenced, which would then be called the complementary DNA, or cDNA for short. This process is known as reverse transcription and is usually followed by PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, in order to amplify the signal, which is why RNA-seq is considered to be indicative of relative expression levels. The region of the genomic DNA, or gDNA, that gets transcribed into mRNA to be expressed is called a gene, right? Now, when that gene is cut and pasted to make alternative sequences that can change the resulting protein, we then categorize that gene into further alternative forms that it can be expressed as that we call isoforms. And by continuing to investigate the commonalities and differences between the libraries and copies of instructions that come from them, we can expand our knowledge of these systems' foundations and the complexities that define them. And this is what makes RNA-seq such a powerful tool for analyzing what parts are actually getting expressed, to what extent they're being expressed, and even at what point they're expressing it, giving us a fairly accurate and descriptive picture of how a sample uses a particular genomic region, if at all. However, take note that every assembly is different, so while one may have an abundance of high-quality RNA-seq organized by cell line, tissue line, sex, age, different experiments, and all that jazz, Others may have, for example, an aggregated track, which is just a combination of all the RNA-seq that was available at that time. You may be given just adult females, adult males, only mixed embryos, or maybe your RNA-seq data is just such low quality that it's inconclusive. Whatever it is, if you're lacking the supporting data in your target assembly, you may want to try referring to DMELS assembly for the track of interest, which in this case would be RNA-seq that we can use as a reference to guide our annotation for our target species. And with this, I would highly, very strongly recommend also checking D. melanogaster's 28 species conservation track for, well, conservation, because if our region of interest is well conserved, we can use DML's tracks as a reference to guide us in our annotation of our orthologous target gene. And if the track indicates low conservation compared to DML, then we can find the species that is most similarly diverged to use as our reference. With a grain of salt, of course, as we should be doing with every track anyways. And on that note, it's also crucial to take into consideration the type of RNA-seq we're looking at in relation to our gene. Take ILP1, or insulin-like protein 1, for example. By doing a quick search on Flybase and by looking at our RNA-seq tracks in the UCSC genome browser for DML, we can see that this gene is meant to be expressed during prepupal stages and is generally inactivated within the first week of adulthood. However, you might be able to see now that this could be a problem if our target species for this gene were to only have adult RNA-seq, for example, or even aggregated RNA-seq because we won't be able to get a very accurate representation of the different ways that it's actually utilized. Now that we have some context, let's go back to the UCSC genome browser for our example target species and gene, D-simulans transformer gene. And I'm gonna go over some ways that we can, can configure the RNA-seq tracks to our advantage. So we can either do each individual one or we can do this for all of them. I'm gonna do it for all of them for this example. So, we can change the type of graph from bar to points to see another view that might make it more obvious where the differences in expression levels occur by focusing on the maximum expression level per nucleotide. Another thing we can do is change the height of the track to improve vertical resolution, and we can also change the scale at which the vertical data is displayed per track. And this one is probably going to be the most useful, or at least in my experience, this has been the most useful one to configure. And that's because by default, the label on the y-axis will be representative of the maximum amount of reads in your current viewing window for each track, right? Well, if you want to see the heights of your track set represented true to scale in relation to each other, you're going to want to take note of the largest value in your desired viewing window before coming to this page. And once you have it, we're going to want to go ahead and change the data view scaling from auto scale to data view to use vertical viewing range setting and we're going to input our max value with a little bit of wiggle room. 
So for example, since our max value for our, our window was 373, I'm gonna go ahead and make our max 375. We can also choose at what horizontal resolution we want the reads to be displayed to us by changing the smoothing window. When it's off, you'll be given single nucleotide resolution. And when it's on, it ought to give you a more accurate but less precise picture of how the reads aligned, which can be useful when working with low resolution RNA-seq data. And if you ever notice that your RNA-seq reads are expressed exactly where they should not be and are lacking where they should be, in other words, they look inverted, you may need to negate the values. It's a pretty simple fix, but a handy fix to know nonetheless. And keeping with the theme of minding what you're analyzing, let's do a quick Flybase search to try and make some sense of these reads. Now, Flybase gives you an extremely well-organized file corresponding to your sign gene. So after going through just about everything on here, I came to the conclusion that the transformer gene is used in both the formation of ovaries as well as the suppression of them, which would explain why even males express this gene that plays a role in ovary production. So as you can see, without knowing the full extent of its role in ovary production and suppression, you might have been confused as to why males express it nearly as much as the females do. And those are just some of the tips and tricks that I've learned and have found to be useful in my years of gene annotation. But there's always more to learn, of course. So I've linked a resource in the descriptions below if you'd like to learn more about how to configure graphical tracks in the UCSC Genome Browser. Now, they may or may not be useful to you, but my hope is that you now have the tools to make the most of your RNA-seq tracks so that you can more intuitively perceive the differences in expression levels. Recall that the processed messenger RNA that's being aligned to the genomic DNA is only composed of the exons, which includes the untranslated regions, but not the introns, which are the sequences that get spliced out of the transcript. These sequences will not be present in the fragments of mRNA that we isolated when we align them to the genomic DNA, causing this characteristic sharp drop in data, indicative of an exon-intron junction. When it looks like the drop overlaps other reads that are expressed equally less or more abundantly, this could potentially be where isoforms differ. Also, depending on your assembly, you may be given some sort of track that's useful for identifying the possible alternative splice junctions, labeled something like splice junctions, intron exon junctions, top hat, bow tie, string tie, cufflinks, or others. But the overall idea is that these will highlight the areas where the reads line up to a discontinuity in the alignment using a track that's color-coded according to the key provided in the track configuration page. It also takes into account the potential canonical splice site donors and acceptors at each junction, so that there's GT and occasionally a GC starting off each intronic region and ending with an AG just before the coding region starts back up again. For the splice junction's predicted track, it looks like the warmer colors such as brown, red, and pink have the most supported reads whereas the cooler colors, like green, blue, and black, have the least. The boxes of this track will represent the compilation of reads that are separated by the intronic sequence present in the genomic DNA, so that they line up to where the RNA-seq reads drop straight down. With this track on, we can see different ways that this gene can get copied, cut, and pasted together to create proteins unique to the task at hand. The 5' prime and 3' prime UTRs, or untranslated regions, that flank each gene just before and after their start and stop codons will also be included in the RNA-seq reads since they're still transcribed for regulation of expression. However, being that they're at the ends of the RNA molecules, these regions are naturally going to be very unstable and prone to degradation, as they should be. But this explains why we get this tapering off at each end. So, the females use both splice site acceptors to express both isoforms A and B. Meanwhile, the males only use one of those two possible splice site acceptors, which is how we get isoform B. This alternative splicing leaves the impression of two distinct relative levels of expression, as seen in the RNA-seq track for our transformer gene. All right, so hopefully you have a better idea now of what RNA-seq is, how it's obtained, how we use it, how we configure it and how it's interpreted than you did before coming in to watch this video. 
But if you still have any unanswered questions, of course, we encourage you first to try and find those answers for yourself. But if you do come across some issues or you want to just double check with us, pick our brains, feel free to drop into our scheduled TA hours. Either way, you've got this, but we'll be here for you if you don't. <laughs> and remember, have a blast. Stina out.